I get a round of applause when I walk out. for being here tonight on this very special occasion. I appreciate everybody coming. There are some extra seats still in the front if anybody would like to come fill in. And it's my honor to welcome President Blake to the law school. So everybody, <laughs> President Blake. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, I, I never, um, two things have never happened to me. One is, I've never had this many students in my sophomore engineering class. <laughs> I'll start there. <laughs> and two is, they never clapped when I came in. So, <laughs> so let me start by um, thanking uh, Professor Ivory and Dean Reed for their leadership and all of their, their staff for, um, for, for all the people. And then certain guests, thank you, Mr. Harvey, for joining us today and sharing his insight. And, you know, it's just, you know, I got a chance to speak with him briefly. Um, he good choices about fraternities. I, that really certified him from the start. <laughs> but, uh, but certainly, um, to, to have this opportunity, this conversation, and to share that broadly across the campus, you know, it's, it's very meaningful, obviously, for me, but certainly something I think, uh, hopefully, as we move forward as Georgia State, this is one of those aspects of the institution. So I know more work will be said, but welcome, and thank you for coming, Mr. Harvey, and hopefully looking forward Great class. Good evening, everyone. I'm LaVonda Reed. I'm the dean at Georgia State University College of Law. I just want to welcome you all to what will be a phenomenal event this evening. Um, we've got a wonderful conversation for you. Steve Harvey in conversation with Professor Mo Ivory, one of our most beloved professors here at the College of Law, as evidenced by the crowd here this evening. I want to thank President Brian Blake for joining us this evening and for supporting this event and the work we do here at the college. Second, I extend my gratitude and appreciation to Professor of Practice Mo Ivory for her hard work, dedication to the College of Law and our students. Through her entrepreneurial spirit, creativity, and initiative, she brought forth her vision to offer our students an interesting and contemporary platform to engage with the law by exploring the real life legal lives of some of today's, and dare I say, Atlanta's, Hotlanta's most recognizable entertainers by implementing the legal life of course series here at the College of Law. I will let Professor Ivory speak more about uh, the series and this installment, but I will note that this series represents experiential learning that is equal parts rigorous, accessible, interesting, relevant, and timely. In this course, the students have the opportunity to engage with legal doctrine and business law concepts centering on ascending careers of well-known figures. I, for one, cannot wait to see who she chooses to study next. Thank you, Professor Ivory and your students for engaging in the law in this way. Now, I have been known to wax nostalgic. And when the opportunity arises like this, I take a walk back in history to prepare remarks for events such as this. So, I paid a, mind in my vi I paid a visit in my mind to the Apollo Theater and retrieved a memory of a feeling I had when I had the opportunity to visit the Apollo Theater a few years ago at the invitation of Dean Leonard Baines, who is the dean at the University of Houston Law Center. The Association of American Law Schools held its annual meeting in New York City that year, and uh, Dean Baines hosted a reception at the Apollo for black law faculty. It was thrilling and inspiring, and I remember taking in the feeling of standing on that stage that had been graced by entertainers known and not yet known. I thought of the Sandman, of course, and hoped that he didn't snatch me off the stage, and the many entertainers performing on what is affectionately, or maybe sometimes not affectionately known as the Chitlin Circuit, to the present. It was an awesome feeling. 
one that would have only been made better if I could have been able to croon a line from Nancy Wilson or Luther Vandross or craft a witty joke like tonight's honored guest. The memory floods my, my spirit whenever I return to Harlem, and it's an honor to share space this evening with one of those greats. Then I queued up a few episodes of the Steve Harvey Show and was reminded of the side-splitting humor and laughs that were served up by Mr. Hightower, Principal Miss Regina Piggy Greer, Seti, and Levita. We had a good time in the 1990s laughing with that crew. As a fictional former R&B performer who was coming to terms with his latest gig as a high school teacher, Mr. Harvey's character, Mr. Hightower, joked that he used to have so much money that when he and his band, the high tops, would deposit a check, the bank would bounce. <laughs> but now that he was so broke that they cut off his refrigerator light, he had to teach school at this high school. We had a good time laughing with those, uh, with those characters. That show um, was pivotal in that his assignment as a band and drama and art teacher was as humorous as it was a critical look at the challenges of inner city public high schools and the ups and downs that often come part and parcel with a career in entertainment. Fast forward to today, when nearly every time I set foot in my house after a long day here at the College of Law, I find my dear mother, Miss Brenda Reed, captivated by an episode of Family Feud. Miss Brenda, she would have been here tonight, but her grandbaby is performing in an orchestra concert across town, and so she sends her regrets. But she did tell me to tell Mr. Harvey that we are cousins by marriage on her side of the family. So we'll, talk, we'll talk about that. So Mr. Harvey wears many hats. <laughs> Many hats, including comedian, actor, author, entrepreneur, style icon, radio talk show host, philanthropist, husband, and father, just to name a few. I, I want to thank the man of the hour, Mr. Steve Harvey, for scheduling time to be with us in person, share his lived experiences, and for opening himself up and his life for study by our law students. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy the program. Well, thank you, Dean Reed, so much. I, I did ask Dean Reed to give two minutes, and well, she's the dean, so there you go. And uh, <laughs> But she did a great thing by um, introducing Mr. Harvey um, by just giving all a brief, and that's just a very brief background of his bio. Um, the students in this class have studied it you know, for 13 weeks, 14 weeks is what the semester is. And so what I wanna start off by doing is sharing with him a little bit of what we talked about and who came to talk to us so that he understands all that we learned about you during the semester. So we did start off with Brandon and um, for everybody here, Brandon is the head of Steve Harvey Global and uh, he's a, an attorney, but he is now an executive of a multi-million dollar company, multi-multi. And uh, he took the time to come in and really set the foundation for us legally um, on that first week of class. And we thank you for that, Brandon. Um, yeah. And what he really wanted us to know is that it's a lot of work. Um, and that although this class is centered around a figure that we um, love as an entertainer and who we spend a lot of our time laughing with, there's also a lot, a lot of business um, behind Mr. Harvey, and we got a chance to really begin to explore it. And so um, after Brandon came, Rashawn McDonald came. I don't know if Rashawn's here. He said he was coming. Um, maybe he's not here yet. He came next to talk about those early years and to just talk about how things got started and the radio show and walked us all through that, and uh, we love the Steve Harvey Morning Show. And then Walter Latham came to talk to us about Kings of Comedy. You had a chance to talk a little bit about it um, to our students, but we will get into it more when we talk about the questions. Next up was Tracy Sherrod from HarperCollins, and she came to talk about the book, um, and she told me to tell you that she's ready for you to write another book. <laughs> I told her I would let pass that along. Um, and then Crystal Seiss came next to talk to us about your Facebook Watch show um, and just how digital assets are being protected and all of those types of things. We looked at a lot um, throughout each of these 
folks coming to visit, we examined a legal agreement that would have gone along with it, a publishing deal or a management agreement or a comedy booking tour agreement. So we would spend some time talking about your experience, we would study the agreements, and then we would have the guest speaker. So then we had, after that, Shirley Strawberry came uh, to talk to us about um, the radio show and just how long she's been. Is it true that she is the longest person that has been on the Steve Harvey Morning Show? Yeah, over 20 years. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so she shared a lot with us. And we had a chance, um, me being a former radio host as well, to talk about women in the industry and, and talk about how she said that you've been a unique um, radio a head of a radio show in that you've always championed everybody and helped them along, whether it was through negotiations of their contracts or whatever um, they were running into at the time, and that is definitely uh, unique. Tiffany Fagus came next from ABC to talk to us about Judge Harvey, and that was an amazing um, class. We had a lot, a lot of fun with her. <laughs> and <laughs> Uh-oh, I feel like you want to say something about that. Okay, hold it. We're going to talk about it. Um, and then Sharon Page and um, the rest of the folks from your um, foundation, the Marjorie and Steve Harvey Foundation, came to talk to us about foundation work and where it all is. So that's what we did the whole semester, um, and it was fascinating to learn all the things that we learned about you. Um, so let's just start off with the early career. I wanted to um, really talk. Say oh, please, because I, I talk to a lot. But I, can you hear me? I talk pretty good. Uh, first of all, uh, I'm honored to be here. You know, I don't take moments like this for granted. You know, I'm, technically, this my life is way beyond anything I have imagined it would be. You know, I'm a product of grace and prayer. You know, if you believe in that, that's what I am. If you don't believe in it, you ought to get to because this, this is how I got here. We're streaming, um, so we're just going to put the microphone on so everybody can okay. hear you. Um, I want to say, man, that I'm really impressed by all of you. I'm impressed by people who get education. You know, I, I don't have that. I, I didn't have the particular skill set that you possess to sit there, the capacity to learn, to listen. I, I just, that was not my groove. You know, I, could, I couldn't get it. Uh, so I'm impressed, man. I mean, you know, I was talking to the students a minute ago, so I was just trying to grasp this law school thing. So you go to college, <laughs> you get a degree, and then you go back to school again. <laughs> what? <laughs> hey, man, let me tell you something. Getting this high school diploma was the hardest thing I've ever done. <laughs> it, was like, it was like major for me. So uh, I just want to say really to all of you, congratulations for making the necessary steps to improve your life. And, and it will pay off. It really, really will. You know, as daunting and hard as and difficult as it is, it has some great, hard work has great rewards, but it is hard work. So I just want to say thank y'all for having me. That's what I wanted to say first. Thank you so much. I want to let you know that the reason why I chose you is not because it could have been anybody else, because you um, said something, those weren't your exact words, but you said, why me or whatever. And I wanted you to know that the reason why is because it's not really about degrees or it's about the journey. And when I'm looking at somebody to study, I want to study somebody who has done things in different disciplines. So radio, television, business, fashion, books. And it's not just for a singer who has had a fantastic career to, for my students to learn. I can get through those two agreements in relatively quick time. Mm -hmm. But it's for somebody who's created an entire career, will have a legacy that follows them, and has also done the service work. So that's the reason why we chose you. Thank I just you. wanted you to know that. Um, so just in the early years um, in stand-up assembling a team, um, I heard you say that the industry, the entertainment industry, is built to keep talent poor or really to make sure that talent always needs to work. We all saw the interview uh, on Earn Your Leisure where you talked about the tax issues. Yeah. And so I wanted to start off by saying, how do you pick people that you want around you to work for you? Well, you know, uh, I, had to, I got better at over the years. You know, my first guy that I had with me who's passed away is Juan Hull. I picked him because he was my friend. I just needed somebody I could trust. You know, I was going out to Hollywood in 90, 92, 93. I didn't know nobody out there. I just wanted somebody I trusted. Uh, 
what happens is, is you learn as you progress, there are people in your life just for a season. And, you know, my father used to say this all the time, everybody come with you ain't going to go with you. You know, some people are in your life just for a period of time. You know, uh, Juan, it was just, he passed in a limo one night after the Steve Harvey show. You know, I wish he could be here today because he was, he, was, he, was, he was not Brandon Williams. <laughs> Trust me. He had a high school diploma too. And we was out there cutting deals the rough way, man. And you know, we made a lot of mistakes. But what I started learning how to do was, I figured out I was lacking in a lot of areas, you know, because I have a high school diploma. So you hear the old saying, if you're the smartest person in your group, you need a new group. I figured that out right away. So I always look for people that were smarter than me. And I've surrounded myself by people who are smarter than I am. Now, here's, here's the catch with me. I don't care how smart you are. I don't care what you know. There ain't a person living going to out-hustle me. You can't out-hustle me. My grind is unmatchable. There is no one on this earth born today that's going to out-hustle me. My father taught me that. He said, boy, look, they can outthrow you, they can outrun you, they can outdance you, they can outsing you, but don't you let no man outwork you. Work covers a lot of things. My ability to work and grind covered a lot of my flaws. And so I started surrounding myself with really, really smart people. And the smarter I got in this business, I kept looking for people who did something better than me. You know, in the early days, if you heard from Rashawn after Juan passed, Juan, uh, Rashawn became my manager. You know, we were frat brothers. Rashawn and I started in comedy. When I started in comedy, Rashawn was a headliner. I was his opening act. But see, me, I was, I was looking at him trying to figure out, okay, why he headlining and I'm opening? Because clearly, <laughs> we streaming, I can't say everything. Okay. <laughs> And, and I decided to put the work in, but he taught me a lot of things. One of the things he taught me was promotions. You know, this was before internet. You know, I was in business before with cell phones, right? So the way I became a draw was, I used to get those little golf pencils and index cards, and every time I went to a city to perform, I would have the waitress, the cocktail waitress, put an index card and a pencil at everybody's seat in the area. And I, after my performance, I said, if you enjoyed my show, Write your address down, and I'll let you know when I'm coming back. Well, stamps was 10 cents. I collect all of the index cards, and then when I come back to town, I get a 10-cent stamp, lick it, and send it, let them know I'm coming, and I start becoming a draw well before other people could become draws. So Rashawn taught that to me. And I, my first lawyer was Ricky Anderson. He was another frat brother, but I always tried to... I forgot to talk about Ricky. He that, that brother right there, and we still connected today, but I trusted him. I, I need people you could trust because they still in this business. This is a cash business. Eventually, you're going to make a lot of money. Somebody going to get you. That's just, if you think that's somebody going to get you, I don't care who you are. You can ask anybody with money. If they ain't never been got, they've been got. So I tried to surround myself with people I trust and people who were smarter than me. Brandon. Uh, when I hired, when I got him from Austin Bird, I was telling this to because he they used to come to Chicago to do deals for me in Chicago, and I just kept watching this guy, how he moved, how he was, and like I was telling the, the group of students a little bit earlier, not only was he brilliant at law, he was a people person. See, you you got to get into the people business, because once you become a lawyer, nobody gonna ask you where you went to law school. We don't know if you can cut this deal, if you can make this money for me. And he was a people person. We went out had cigars one night, and I just said, man, this guy's a people person. So he was with acquisitions and mergers. So guess what? I had never acquisitioned or merged nothing. <laughs> but since I said, I'm going to get me some money one day and get into acquisitions and mergers, let me get a guy that's brilliant at that. So not only did I hire him away from Austin Bird, but as we progressed, he became not only my CLO, but my COO of everything I do. That's not only because he's trustworthy, but because this dude's people skills is like wicked. See, we're in show business. You know, we got to sit out there with them, man, 
you know, they just lying. They, they're lying to you. And so we got to sit out there and figure that out, and then we got to make moves. And Brandon became, he's in charge of my Middle East division. He's in charge of my Africa division. He's in charge of my America division because he works hard. Now, that sounds like a lot. I'm not going to have nobody in charge of Africa, the Middle East, and America because I don't trust you. It may get to that, but I got one guy in charge of all of that. Now, he making the money, so, but it's, 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 it's a difficult process. But that's what I did. I looked for people who were smarter than me. You've got to be smart. If, what's, what's a stupid lawyer? What, 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 is, what is that? How does that work? <laughs> so, you know. Oh, <laughs> it is a lot of them. And it's a lot of lawyers that's not people. You know, if you into, like, corporate law and stuff, you might not have to deal with people. But if you want to get to that money, you got to deal with people. They're only going to pay you so much to push paper. You make money with people. You don't make money with paper. That's right. You only make so much money pushing paper, man. What I care. You know, you got to be able to get on a plane, go sit and talk with somebody. You got to come back with a deal. You got to find deal, procure business. That's how you make money. So that was, that was my... This is not my next question, but it occurs to me to, to ask you when... A stressful situation comes up like, you know, somebody's stolen $22 million from you. Law students have stress all through the three, three years they're in law school, and then they have to take a bar exam after. Um, stress and anxiety has become very topical these days because of COVID. What, are you, what in those times are you doing to keep the hustle going like we all see you doing and deal with the stress at the same time? Well, you know, I mean, it comes with time, but you got to understand something. Let me ask you a question. How many of you in here have been through some hard times? How many of you have had some days you ain't know how you was going to make it? How many of you thought you just wasn't going to make it and was going to have to give up? Okay, now let me tell you something about yourself. Your track record for surviving unsurmountable, difficult, give up days, your track record for surviving those days is 100%. You've survived them all. So what makes you think you ain't going to finish up with the rest of them? See, you got to get, you got to get, you got to understand what's happening. This is life. COVID was for everybody. Everybody been dealing, this is global pandemic. This is real. You ain't the only one, COVID, you ain't the only one lost somebody you love. You ain't the only one got put out. You ain't, okay, and life don't care. It don't care, man. It just keeps coming. You get the next card, you get the next card, because life just dealing them out. So you got to understand through experience that if your track record for surviving unsurmountable, unforgettable, unthinkable days is 100%, you got to know, as I heard Tom Hanks so eloquently say online, he wished he knew when he was younger that this too shall pass. I don't care what's happening. It has to pass. Now, that's spiritual. But that's another thing. And let me, before I say anything else, I don't know what you heard about me in this class, but let me tell you something. <laughs> I'm just going to tell you real. I'm here because of my faith. I'm here because of God's grace and mercy. Now, if you got something else you want to hear, I ain't your man. Because I ain't got no education. I ain't got, I've lost everything I ever owned twice. Been homeless, stuttering problem, sleeping in a car, two divorces. What, what? 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 That's favor. That's grace. That's mercy. If you don't understand that, you need to get to understanding that. Because I got news for you, and you can ask Mr. Brandon Williams. It's going to have days as a lawyer, you ain't going to know what to do. Your little books ain't going to save you. The little book, <laughs> that little stuff. Everything ain't in a book. Some of this stuff is life, man. And you got to have something else behind your education to get you through. That's the truth of the matter. So this dude you're looking at that done made it is because of God's grace, mercy, and favor. And my mother was a praying woman. I'm a product of prayer. So now, put that in your notebook <laughs> if you really want to learn yourself something. Because you're going to need that. You're going to need that more than that education. Watch what I tell you. Because once you get that degree, it just hangs on the wall. After that, it's, it's about you. 
Brandon shared a story with me one time. He went into his law firm and he was sitting down and he's telling his boss at Austin Bird how difficult it was and how he was having these cases. And, and he just went on and on about the troubles. And his boss sat there for 15 minutes and let Brandon talk. And when Brandon got through talking, his boss looked at me and said, hey, Brandon, it's hard. It's just hard. You coming in here with all these, comp it's hard. You ain't finna get rich easy. And that's what me and Brandon's thing, we look at each other sometimes, we be on the plane, we look at each other and go, it's hard, dog. <laughs> it's hard. And we've been, we've been in the Middle East. It's hard, because we've been in the meeting, they'll just start speaking Arabic. <laughs> you, now that ain't no language you can just pick stuff up and go, oh, you know what I think they said? No, you don't know what they said. They get through talking Arabic, me and Brandon look at each other and go, it's hard, dog. <laughs> And so once you understand that, you, 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 you expect that to go that way. Thank you for that. Um, so Kings of Comedy was a huge success. You made a lot of money doing that. What was that experience like when Walter, you, know, you, you talked about saying, he was like, we can sell out stadiums over and over. And you were like, no, nah, no. Nah, and he just oh. made you believe, a 26-year-old kid, that you could do that. And then it actually happened. And it was a movie. And it kept on going. What was that You know, like? all of us were older than Walter. See, Kings of Comedy, when it first jumped, it was just me, uh, Sid, and Bernie. D.O. was added the next year. The first year was just me, Sid, and Bernie. And he said, look, man, y'all selling 5,000 seaters. I want to put y'all together, and we're going to sell 20,000 seaters. And we, that was, like, unthinkable. But he had this vision, and he was right. And he had a sponsor, Crown Royal, and they was paying goo gobs of money. <laughs> and I don't even drink. And so I was having trouble as the host because I didn't want to promote the brand, you know. But then after they gave me this money, I was, you know. <laughs> I was pouring liquor, you know. I was, <laughs> Backstage serving and have don't I don't ever drink. I've never been drunk before. I've never been high before. I've never smoked weed. I ain't never tried nothing. I ain't knocking it. It's just, it just ain't my thing. I don't need that. You know, I got I got I, I'm already it's something wrong with me anyway. <laughs> Last thing I need is to introduce an additive. So so there was never any, I mean, the entertainment world is very celebratory um, yeah. and always pushing things. That There was never a time that some executives were, have a drink with us or oh, have oh, some. Look, and, that ain't what I, we, so, that ain't, that ain't me. You just never felt like you needed to do that. I don't care what you're talking about. You're not getting me in a position to mess my money up. You can't take me out of who I am because I can't be nowhere inebriated. You know, I was a dude in college where, you know, I, I took everybody home. We go to the party. They knew I wasn't going to drink, man. Let's go with love, man. Love going to take us home. And I take everybody home. I'm, I, I, I didn't need it. You know, and then Hollywood traps you. See, this business is cold, man. They, they, they have the parties with everything you need. The devil busy, man. You understand? So taxes, drugs, and women is your downfall. And if you don't think it is, come out there. And they got it for you. And they serving it up in bowls. And at the party, it's just feeding it to you. All the free, what you want, what you want. You take pills, you snort what you want. They give it to you, give it to you. And next thing you know, you be holding to them. Now you hooked. Now your next negotiation, take it or leave it. It's a tricky business, man. And if you don't think it's happening, it's very, very real. Because television has changed. You know, it's 800 stations now. You know, back when I was on TV, man, it was ABC, NBC, CBS. And then it was a few network, uh, Fox came out, and then the WB came out, and then uh, Up came out, and then it went, it went that was it. Yeah. Fox, and it was all, net, all network shows after ABC, NBC, CBS. All network shows start with black shows. You ever notice that? Mm -hmm. A startup network, always, look at the WB, look at the CW. Mm -hmm. All of them, they always start with black shows. You know why? Because instant audience. Instant audience. So then they get the instant audience, but they tell all the black shows, you have to have a white on your show. That's why I had uh, Elizabeth on my show, and Bullethead on the show. Jamie Foxx was the only one that stood up and said, I ain't going to do it. I ain't had time for that argument. You can bring all the white people in here you want. 
I need this check, dog. <laughs> but every, parenthood, everybody, you know, and when I had the Steve Harvey show, uh, uh, me and the boys, I had, I had three sons and a mother-in-law living in the house. They want a white person on the show so bad, they introduce a little white girl on the show and say, she'll come over and play with your sons. What? <laughs> Where? Where? In this world? Do you send your daughter, white, black, yellow, or blue, next door to play with the three boys? Where that happened at? Nowhere. And so I had to shoot that down. But you look at the way TV is, man, and, 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 and it has so many trappings, but you, you know, man, you kind of learn as you, as, you, as you go along how to avoid the traps and everything. I hope I'm answering your question. No, you are. I mean, because my ne it just goes right into it about what were the challenges in TV that led you to be interested in doing Family Feud and knowing you would have to bring all of your, you know, vigor and to that show because it was struggling. Well, you know, I didn't, I didn't want to do Family Feud. When they first came to me 13 years ago, uh, they flew me out to L.A. They said, we have a game show we're interested in you hosting. And I had heard that Howie Mandel was getting tired of doing deal or no deal. So I went, cool. So I flew out there. And when I get out there, they said, it's family feud. And I said, I don't want to do it. And they said, why? I said, because I, the show is nothing now. You know, after Richard Dawson, it was a show. And it was a 1.4 in the ratings. I'm not hooking myself up to this wagon. This, this plane is already on the way down. Why would I fasten myself into a seat belt for this? <laughs> and they had hired different hosts every year, every year. And so I said, no. And so they said, we want you to look at a tape. So they showed me this tape of the last host. And the question was, name your favorite pet. And the guy said, a cow. <laughs> the, the host said, let's see if it's up there. <laughs> You ain't said dog, cat, goldfish, hamster, puppy. Your first answer is cow. I told him, I said, they said, well, what would you do? First of all, I'm not turning around to see if it's up there. Because who the hell has a cow walking around shitting in their living room? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's how I felt. And she said, well, what would you do? I would ask him, why did he say cow? And the lady said, oh, no. You can never make a disparaging remark against an answer that a contestant has. I said, well, see, then you don't want me. I said, because I have a skill set. I said, this is what I'm going to do. So they said, well, let's try it. So they had me come back the next day. And they set up a dummy family actress. And they brought the camera crew in to film it. And so they were doing the little lines, and I had the cameramen just rolling laughing. They, they were shaking. They was dropping the cameras. They was walking away. And they said, oh, my God, that's fantastic. How did you do that? Did they give you the questions? I said, no. And she said, well, and so I said, so the, the lady said, well, I can't take a chance on this, because this could be offensive and offend our listeners. Well, you got 1.4. <laughs> <laughs> Little over 1,100 people. <laughs> 1 1.1 1 million, you, you, that ain't nobody. And so this lady, Gabby Johnston, who's the executive producer, she said, I think he's on to something. I want to give him a shot. I said, no, that's right. You ain't got to fight for me. I don't want to do it. And so she said, but let me ask you a question. You were so funny. We have to do 200 shows. How can you be that funny every single night? We're going to have to, i tell you what we'll do. We'll give you the questions the night before and you can write your jokes. I said, I don't need that. She said, why not? I said, this is all I, I, this all I got. I ain't got nothing but jokes. I can't fix cars. I definitely don't know law. So I'm going to write jokes. They said, 
how will you be able to write the jokes for 200 shows? I said, pay me. <laughs> they paid me, and then that's when I took the show. And then the second year, we were like a 2-4. Then we went to a three something, then we went to a four, then it was a five and it's climbing. And then next thing you know, it was the number one game show in the world with a seven. <laughs> and the, the secret behind it is, the only thing I do on Family Feud is, I say what I know everybody at the house is thinking. <laughs> That's all I do. And I just became a reflection of people watching TV and I turn a a game show into a comedy show. Because look at it, Family Feud is a survey game. Top 100 people surveyed said, who gives a damn? <laughs> who cares what 100 people think? But they do care about the response. So somebody on YouTube did a clip. The actual questions and answers on a 30 minute show of Family Feud is 90 seconds. That's the question and answer. The rest of it is me talking to them. That's the show. And that's, that's how I did it. And it was really by accident. But once again, that's God put me in a position that I wasn't even ready for. And little, how did I know that it would turn into this thing? Do you, man, look, people, <laughs> people pay me to come to their company to do Family Feud. We got a board we travel with and everything. <laughs> I charge so much money. <laughs> When they pay me, I'm embarrassed. I, I, I think even my check, I'd be going, oh my God. Oh my God, thank you so much. <laughs> well, we talked about negotiating for you in class many times. And we um, we renegotiated your family feud agreement. Um, and really? What y'all come up with? Because uh, <laughs> we're in the middle of that right now. <laughs> What y'all well, come up with? Well, we, um, anybody in the class can also participate in this. I mean, I think we were paying you $40 million. Um, we were um, We were decreasing the time as you got older for the commitment so that you could have some of your personal life back. Um, not with a pay decrease, just so you could have some personal time back. <laughs> You're welcome. We wanted you to be able to... Brandon, bring her with it. So in most of the agreements that we've negotiated for you throughout the semester, we've talked about a de-escalating clause on term um, in order that you still get paid the same amount of money, but you get more of your time back. Um, and so we've transitioned you into a succession plan, and we've had all kinds... Wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> you're talking to me like I know what you're talking about. <laughs> We transitioned you into a succession plan. The hell do that mean? What is so, that? So we just thought about when you might not be able to do certain things anymore and how you would be teaching others to be able to slowly step into positions and give uh, you your time uh, you back. you can take that out. Oh, that's not going to happen? Yeah, I ain't going to okay. do that. When I leave, I don't give a damn what happened to that show. <laughs> I'm gonna be in the I'm gonna be on a yacht in the Mediterranean, pimp. <laughs> but seriously, what does when you were first starting out Family Feud and, and talking about leverage, right? And you're so highly leveraged at this point when you go into a deal and everybody knows who you are. What is the conversation like when a deal is presented? How do you choose what is what you will do because you have so many opportunities and can create so many new opportunities? What's that conversation like in the sense of how you will go in and what you will get for what you want? Well, you know, the negotiation is, is, is a slippery slope, you know, because... They're going to offer you what they want you to accept. And if you accept it, they're the happiest person in the world. Me and Brandon's philosophy is this. We only sign a deal. A good deal is when everybody signs it hurts a little. I didn't get exactly what I wanted, but you paid me more than you wanted to. See, when everybody signs and we all hurt a little bit, then that's a good deal. That's our philosophy. You very rarely are going to get everything you ask for, but you have to go in from a position of strength, like you say. Right. And being in a position that I'm in today is a lot 
more favorable than when you start because you're a pig in a blanket in the beginning. You know, you don't, you got to prove yourself and all this here. But then they real slick because you got to remember when you go in the room to negotiate for a client or you may be on the corporation side, you know, your job is to come in as though this is it. This is the value of you. We can't pay you anymore. Or well, I don't give a really care what you think of me. I, I, I'm, I'm, I, have, I have a family to take care of. And it's me who's turning that corner with that suit on. So when I come around that corner, okay, if you got somebody else you can hire that can turn that corner and do this show like me, then go on and get to paying them whatever you want to pay them. But if you want me and the, see, I'm going to get you a seven when I come around that corner. Mm -hmm. Without me, you was getting a one four. No, I know when I come around the corner, you get a seven. Now, if you like that seven, and I know what seven pay, if I know that your company is making a hundred million in ad revenue sales, I got a real good idea what you need to give me, and and that's and 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 that's the way we go about it. And you got to use all of that when you're negotiating for your client. Now, once again, if you're on the corporate side, I. I'm not going to really care for you, and I don't care <laughs> what you get out of this class. <laughs> Me personally, if you got start vomiting and left right now, I'd be perfectly comfortable with that. <laughs> But if you're wanting to be on the client side, then let me help you. If you're a corporate person, really, I, I, I don't even like you. <laughs> because at this point, I mean, really, Brandon and I, we sitting in a meeting and we realize what the enemy is. This person is trying to pay me as less as possible because he earns his stripes in the company by being able to say, I've delivered you, Steve Harvey, for this. That man, once I know that's your angle, man, me and you, man, we, uh, we, we, we hard folks to sit cross from because I'm, I'm already edgy. I already understand what I'm dealing with. And I got that's your job, but your job is to not allow me to be as successful as I could be. That's a funky job to have, man. Mm -hmm. And if I were considering the type of law I'm getting into, I would think about that. Because you're going to be very well and deservedly hated. <laughs> and a lot of people are going to hate you. Your car tires going to get cut. A lot of, it's a lot, a lot of people are going to be looking for you. Especially if you get into this hip-hop thing. They find you. Can you tell us um, an example of a deal that you said, uh, no, I am not doing that? I can imagine that people want to request you for all kinds of deals. Is, can you think of a deal that you said, I am not doing that? I mean, we do it all the time. I mean, you know, it's people who, churches, are, bless us with your, mm-mm, mm, -mm, mm, -mm. <laughs> that your opening negotiation bless us no when you what about blessing me you a church bless me that that's the beginning of a start and then as you know we don't have you know here's a you know we don't have what you normally make but if you would see it in your heart well my heart don't have eyes so i'm not gonna see that Tell me what you're offering, and let's go from there. Now, I say no to a lot of things. You know, I, I don't do uh, the worst gig I ever took. What, when, I, when I learned this was when I first got started. I was a young act, and they hired me for this dude's birthday party in Pepper Pike, which was a suburb of Cleveland. And the pay was $100. And, you know, back then, I was $25 a night, $50 at best. A hundred dollars. I just took it. A hundred dollars, man. And I went to Pepper Pike. I get to this birthday party. The dude that I'm performing in front of is 87 years old. He's dead. <laughs> now, his son hired me, who was at the comedy club Tuesday night, and thought I was hysterical. My dad's going to love this. His father was dead. 
the entire time. I stood in front of a fireplace, and I'm going to tell you something. I wanted to just lay back into that fire and just go on and go to hell. This was the worst. This $100 was the most painful $100. That kid paid me at the end. He said, God, you were great. I sucked. Nobody laughed but the kid that hired me. <laughs> the dead people remained dead the entire time. His father didn't even know I was talking. And I learned that day right there that all money ain't good money. And so I started being very careful with what I chose after that. Now I made some mistakes. Biggest mistake I ever made was for a million dollars one night. I took a gig, 2008, New Year's Eve, Detroit. Because they offered me a million dollars. The other headliner was Cat Williams. Cat and I were pretty cool, but some things happened. And somehow, Cat and the promoter turned it into a boxing match. So they told me that I would enter the Joe Louis Arena in a robe and I would climb into a boxing ring and it was going to be a heavyweight match to see who knocked who out and I was going to go first. And then Cat was to come on. Well, I told him, uh, you know, I'm fly. I wear suits. I'm not finna wear no robe. So the robe is out and I said, I'm not climbing the rope. Take all them ropes down. It was one of the worst decisions I've ever made because I took the money. I hated the entire night. Cat went up on that stage and his whole show was about me. Wasn't nothing to do with the show or nothing. I mean, he was just in me, man. Just doing him, to doing his thing. And it was a horrible night. Oh, I made the money. But that night, 2008, going into 2009, the worst night of my life ever on stage. Got a million dollars. New Year's Eve. But boy, that was an ugly million dollars. The internet was all over me, man. Laughing at what Cat had said and all this. Here. I got, nah, 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 nah. You wrote, man, your, your career finished. Cat mopped you up. Comedy is not a beef or a battle. This is not rap, man. We go up, you do our jokes. You don't supposed to come up and this ain't this ain't how we do comedy. I wasn't I wasn't prepared for it. I never mentioned him not one time in my act. And it was just crazy. But they wrote me off. But let me I'm just I'm gonna show you something. You gotta hang in there when you get wrote off. You gotta hang in there when it don't go right. Because 2009, little did I know, my book was coming out, Act Like a Lady, Think Like a Man, on around the 18th and 19th. That bad boy came out and stayed on the New York Times bestseller list at number one for 38 weeks. So, so much for your career is finished. That book, I don't know if Tracy told you, that book made, whew. and it wasn't, I didn't even do a good deal. I did a deal where I got a nice check up front, and I made money off the book. I made, I was making, that, that book still, but it's the gift that keeps on giving. Every April 1st and October 1st, I get a check. I got a check April 1, I went, I put it aside for Mother's Day because I'm finna buy my wife something cold. Well, not, well, Mother's Day, then the anniversary is June. Uh, all the money is going for her anniversary gift in June, which is, I promised her something real special. So um, y'all pray for me. Uh, <laughs> I got to save up for this one. So all that money is going to go for her gift. She gets way more money than I do. <laughs> I don't know how God set this arrangement up. I make all the money, all of it. She don't even work. Can you edit that out? Before? I got caught up. I just got caught up in that. So that book was on the, the for 38 weeks. I mean, what does that make you feel about? You had several books after that. But what about another book of that sort of nature that could be turned into? I mean, do you think about that? I have one. It's oh. already written. So when will we see that? I got, how many ladies did I get, Paige? How many, Hannah? 
Hannah was there. I had about 40 women come at Tyler Perry Studios, and I sat there for a week with 40 women, and I wrote a new book. And I did it two years ago, and I'm just sitting on it. Now, Will Packer has found out the name of the book and has already offered me money Enough. for the movie rights. Already, because the name of the book is so dope that I'm not going to say because, and y'all so brilliant in here, y'all are. <laughs> <laughs> mm -mm. But it's so dope. Will Packard has already offered me money for the rights to the movie. But I'm a lot more selective this time. Because, see, even though uh, the book got turned into a movie the first time, if I had known what I know now, oh, my God, I would have made. You know, that movie did over $100 hundred million. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So what would you do differently? Oh. Uh, Complete ownership. Right. Ownership is key for us right now. Everything. Uh, ownership is the key. And I sold it and I banked on the movie doing points. And it did all the points. I hit all the bonus marks. And tens of, you know, millions and millions, was, I was making it. But if I owned it, I would I would have had the, the lion's share of it. And I didn't. Because I, I bet on the points. But, see, I was in tax trouble. And I needed money. And so I was just doing the deals best I could. So looking back on it, man, it would have been ownership for me. Like now, for us, that's all it is. If there's no equity ownership, we don't, we don't do nothing. Anymore. We talked a lot about ownership when we were negotiating uh, your agreements about limited rights to your name and likeness, about total ownership of whatever the product what and the, the content. <laughs> really? Yeah. Um, just about how we would want to see. Let me, let, let me ask you a question. Yeah. When you all do this type of thing, when you come to whatever conclusion you're saying, you're pretty much secure in your findings. Sure. So what we did was we would learn about your career and then we would basically renegotiate whatever deal you were in, whether it was Family Feud Africa, whether it was, uh, uh, Rashawn told us that you did not have a written management agreement, so we put you in a written management agreement. Um, we thought that was safer moving forward. <laughs> We did. We just a did that. Written through. management agreement. <laughs> well, just you know things that we thought as as. Uh, you know, I've never done that. Really. I've never done that. Why? I'm not signing myself to a piece of paper to a person. Mm -hmm. You can't. Like like for example, when Rashawn started managing me, I was after the Kings of Comedy. Mm -hmm. So if I'm gonna do a tour date, why am I giving you a percentage? All you gotta do is answer the phone. Now here's a salary. Rashawn made a lot of money. A lot of money with, between the radio and our career. But you can't get a piece of my comedy career. Are you kidding me? No, it was built. So if I got a managerial degree, see, I don't have a manager now. I, I did a deal with uh, IMG for my talk show. I ain't signing nothing. Mm. So see, so now that's over with. Bye. Yeah. You know, y'all, y'all, you put me in a deal with um, um, uh, 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 Miss Universe. I, 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 See, okay, this is a different story. 2015. When Let me I, just say that in your management agreement, we did exclude your comedy career, any stand up, oh, any you. tours, <laughs> and things like that. <laughs> just you're so, a bad just, girl. <laughs> oh, you a bad girl. So just so we did uh, exclude. Uh, excuse me. <laughs> we took that out. <laughs> that, was, that was good. See, uh, 2015, Miss Universe, right? Yeah. The infamous, you said the wrong name. You know, that was like, man. See, the truth of what really happened was crazy. And I, I, I almost wish I hadn't played it that way, but I did. Mm -hmm. See, you, I, I don't make mistakes on TV. I, I, I've been on it too long. I have an IFB in my ear. Mm -hmm. I have a teleprompter. And I got a card. Now, on this card through practice has been two names all week long. Because since we bought, we bought uh, Miss Universe from Donald Trump at the time, that's when Donald Trump was like, you know, okay. And uh, <laughs> we bought it from Donald Trump, right? And so they used to do 
and it was anticlimactic when they would go, and the first runner up is, and now Miss Universe just standing there. She's the one, but Jen, you got to celebrate the first one up. So they decided to change it. They wouldn't announce the first one. They'd say second runner up, and then they'd have the two ladies standing there, and the next person, you just name Miss Universe. We practiced like that all week. So we get there at night, and the teleprompter says, and the new 2015 Miss Universe is, I'm reading it in the teleprompter. The director in my ear says, read the second name, Steve. And on the card was Miss Columbia. Now, the lady that used to work for Trump decided she don't want to do it like that the night of. So she puts a third name on the card, but when they handed me the card, the third name is under my thumb at the bottom left-hand corner of the card. I don't even see no third name, which would, didn't matter anyway, because the teleprompter said, and the new 2015 Miss Universe is, second name, Steve, Miss Columbia. Great job, Steve. Go to the back. Let's wrap it up. I go to the back two minutes later. My boy come up to me and say, hey, dog, you said the wrong name. I said, I ain't saying shit wrong. What are you talking to me about? I said the name that was on the card and what his ass told me to say. I ain't saying nothing wrong. So I said, damn, they out there crowning Miss Columbia. So he said, man, that's cool, man. Don't worry about it. I said, I'm going to go out here and fix it. The, they told me in my ear, don't do that. We'll fix it tomorrow in the paper. I said, no, I'm going to go give it to this girl now. Mm -hmm. And I walked my ass out there. That was the most noble, dumbest shit I've ever done. That was the right thing to do. Though. No, that was the right thing. I could have kicked. I was kicking my... You don't even know how I felt that night. Because then I had to go to a press conference. The Columbia media was there. And they was in my ass, man. Them people was cutting me to pieces. So I go home that night, I can't sleep. My wife says, all right, we go home next day. And I don't know how bad it is till I wake up. And it's everywhere. I got people calling me, man, from Africa, Italy. Yo, man, what happened, dog? You all right? Da, 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 da. Now, before that, I had asked God, one of my prayers, I was asking God to increase my global brand and persona. Do you know in 48 hours, the name Steve Harvey was Googled four billion times in 48 hours. I was the most famous person in the world for 48 hours. You know what God had did? He had increased my global <laughs> brand and persona. Now, I didn't appreciate the way he did it, but boy, my ass was famous. <laughs> and it, it turned out to be a horrible situation, and I got a lot of death threats from Colombians. Oh, my, this is my daughter right here. She'll tell you, they, they were taking notes and tying them on rocks, throwing them over my gate. They were threatening my children, my wife, you're going to die. Since 2015, I have had armed guards at my house front and back since 2015. I live with four armed policemen around my property at all times. Because I'm not playing with them. Now you run up here if you want to. Because I don't know who y'all are, you know, I'm kind of hood, you know, so. And I ain't really, and then I bring a lot, I have a lot of illegal friends from my past who come down, who do things for 1500. <laughs> Look at all these lawyers. Is, is he our client? Is this? <laughs> but as, as, let me, the, the beauty of it was this happened in December, right? Along came the Super Bowl. Verizon came to me, T-Mobile came to me to do a commercial. They paid me so much money to mock that the little T-Mobile commercial was. I said the name, and then I went, I got it right. Yes, I got it right. That was a commercial. They paid me millions for that. I'll go out there and say that name wrong every damn week if you want me to. 
So you know, once again, it's opportunities like you have to hang in there when adversity hits because you know you never know how to turn for you. You're going to have a lot of adversity in your career, and you've got to be able to. Okay, let, let, let me tell you this. You all in law school, you have this dream, whatever it is of being whatever kind of lawyer it is. I want you to understand something. Every dream gets tested. Every single dream gets tested. You're not just going to be a lawyer because you want to be. Somebody might not pass the bar the first time. So what you through now? Or you going to go again? I got a partner that failed the bar three times before he made it. Now, I don't use him. <laughs> hey, 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 look here. I can't have you have some dumbass moment <laughs> with me. No, really, man. I, you know, hey, look here. Uh, you can't, you can't, be, you can't, you're not practicing law with me. No, you got to be doing law. Ricky Anderson, his nickname is City, who was my first lawyer. We call him City because Ricky bought this big house in Texas and he just from the city, man. He don't know nothing about the country. He bought a five acre lot in a wooded block, cut every tree down on his five acre lot because he don't like trees. <laughs> Because he's from the city. He had no hedges around his... You can see the foundation of his house with the brick. He didn't have flowers along the edge of it. You can see an ant coming up in his house. And we called him City. He passed the bar before he finished law school. Because he a gangster ass dude. He said, I got to get at this. He passed the bar before he finished law school. Go figure that I hired him because of the hustle in him. You see what I'm saying? Now you, but, but if you do fail the bar, you got to keep going. Every dream you have is going to be tested. Understand that. Ain't no easy walk to the top. Ain't no stairway to the top. You got to, ain't no elevator to the top. You got to take the stairs. You're going to be tested. What you going to do when you get tested? Because you're going to get told no a bunch of times. So what you going to do? You got to master that. But the only way to master it is you got to get knocked down to understand how to get up. You must fall and roll over to know what it is to have to recover. You got to be down to understand up. You got to be under to know how to get over. You got to get to the low point to appreciate the high point. If you don't think it go like that, man, you might well get out of school now because you're going to get tested. Now, the question is, what you going to do when the test come? Because you think this test in here hard. You think the bar hard? Oh, wait. Wait till you get a load of life. It ain't nothing like it, man. It's nothing like it. So you got, you got to keep fighting and digging. You, you got to be funky. I tell people all the time, you got to develop the dog in you. You have to develop a tenacity in you. If you don't have dog in you, man, you're done. You the, 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 the little pussycat attitude, that don't work. You got to be a dog. I don't care if you're a lady. I don't care what religion you're in. You got to be funky. You want to win, you got to get funky, man. And I don't mean nasty step on nobody. But when they bite, at one, you can't keep walking past people when they snapping at you. You got to turn around stop some of this snapping. See, I'm not like I'm a Christian, right? But I'm like a really like underdeveloped Christian, you know, like I don't like really do like, I don't like do like high level Christianity. I don't, I'm not like on a scale of one to 10, I'm, you know, I'm like a two. And that's good. Because I, that's the level of Christianity I can work on. You know, like, you know, like, if, like you slap Bishop Jakes. He'll turn the other cheek because he's a high level Christian. You slap me. Will Smith, let me explain something to you. It's, it's no way you slapping me. Turn around, button your jacket, and walk off that stage. They're going to have to go to four commercial breaks. 
I'm not saying I wouldn't get slapped, but I'm just saying, for you sit your ass back in your chair, Jada and everybody else gonna have to move out the way. Cause we're gonna be down here moving furniture around, partner. That's the type of Christian I am. I'm sorry. Oh, I want to talk about that so badly with you, but we're going to move on for the sake of... Oh, really? That uh, is. But I'm a, let, let me say this, though. I mean, when you saw that happening, were you watching the Oscars uh, when that happened well, at I home? Was, I, was at, I was in Abu Dhabi. Okay. And, and but you, the feed came up right away. Okay. My son said, Dad, he brought it to the hotel room. It was like 15 minutes after it happened. Okay. It was online. Here's, here's the deal. I'm very good friends with Chris Rock. I think he handled it admirably. Admirably. People talk about what they would have did, but... Man, I, how he stand there. You, that's the last thing you expect. Yeah. To be standing on stage at the Oscars and somebody come up and slap you. That's you. Because when he saw him come, he said, oh, here come Richard. Because he was thinking, you know, he coming up there to say something. It was alarming. But he hauled off power and he slapped Chris. But let me tell you how punk of a move that really was. Mm -hmm. Look, man, we in showbiz, so we know how this is. He knew that was the only place he could walk up, slap an adult male, turn around, close his jacket, and walk back to his seat. Where else? Where else in this world can you go slap a full-grown man, turn around, and button up your jacket? You see, that, that was such a... Hollywood move. He knew he could get away with that. That's why he did it. That's all that is, man. I lost a lot of respect for him that day. You know, and I, I text Rock after that. He said, I'm okay, man. I said, I'm just trying to work through it. You know what I mean? And like then after the party, after the thing, he had the party holding the Oscar dancing. Oh, no, homie. No. I'm at all these parties. <laughs> they be looking for that Oscar. And when they find it, they're going to have to wipe it off. I'm telling you that right now. You're not finna be at the party, partying with the Oscar. Because I ain't that way. And I'm 65 years old, man. Mm. And I still, because of the way I was raised, I have a certain element in me. And you know, I was raised, you can't kick nobody, spit on nobody, or slap nobody. Mm -hmm. And to this day, you cannot talk about Illos Vera Harvey. And Illos Vera Harvey has left this world 25 years ago. And to this day, if you say anything about my beloved mother, you can ask my daughter. It's on and cracking. She done seen it. If you say something about my mama, I don't care. I don't care how old I get. I'm finna do something to you. <laughs> we we not playing this game. And that's just that's just how I come up. I just thought it was such a soft, just chump move, man, on his part. And now he's in India now. Oh. You know, we all went to India to visit with this uh, ashram to do like some spiritual work. Oh, well, whatever. You know, you <laughs> you know, you go to India. You could have went to the Potter's house in Dallas if you wanted totally. some spiritual work. Totally. You know, all this. You can go over there and see the Dalai Lama, the Lama Dalai. You can go see whoever the hell you want. When you come out that cave, <laughs> Steve gonna be out there waiting on you. You come back in here. You can sell incense. You can do whatever you want. You can get you some orange and wet. Okay, let me stop. <laughs> all right. So human resources. Human we're gonna. Resources. Go, thank you for sharing that with us. We all um, wanted to know how you felt about that, and uh, that gives us an inside look. Um, <laughs> going back to ownership and international deals, uh, we talked about your uh, taking Family Feud to Africa, and we were completely intrigued by your production company owning that product, um, Brandon going there and learning the fine points of <laughs> negotiating that international deal, which he shared with us that, you know, he was learning as he was doing those deals. Because I called him one day from Botswana mm -hmm. when the vision came to me. Because okay. when God give me something, I go right away. What, your opinion, what you think of it don't matter to me. I don't even listen to people. You know, if God puts something in my heart, and I'm not saying that to sound like extra spiritual, but I do, I follow instructions. I call Brandon and say, Brandon, I want to do a uh, family feud in Africa. And uh, I want to do it next year. And click, I hung up. Mm -hmm. 
Now, Brandon, <laughs> I mean, the credit to him, if it wasn't for Brandon, the deal don't happen. Because Brandon is a dude I can go to with stuff like that. Because, you know, well, Mr. Harvey, well, hold on, Mr. Harvey, what you want? What, what, what you mean what I want? Hell, if I knew how to do it, why I call you? <laughs> I call you, and he went and made it happen and researched it yes. and came up with it, you know. He talked to us about walking through and in discussions with the Fremantle people and walking through that whole deal. And then the concern about, well, you're going to have to put the Africa, you know, the, the two countries you're in, the spin on their culture, right? Because the questions are very cultural related. Like, you know, what's your 100 people think is a favorite pet? Well, maybe a cow is not the pet. In, um, well, maybe, it, I don't know. Yeah, what, cows what are very valuable over there. <laughs> yeah, right, so that may be it. But you still had to put your cultural, how do you do that um, to still make it humorous and funny and relevant to the culture? Well, the thing I did, the, the one thing I've understood, I am to be uniquely me no matter what. Mm -hmm. I don't go and try to fit into nothing else. I just go and I let y'all fit into me. So when I went to Africa, it was a huge cultural thing going on. I didn't understand half the questions or answers. You know, name your favorite food. Bonnie Chop. <laughs> Bonnie Chop is really a food. <laughs> Bonnie Chow, right there. <laughs> She's from South Africa. I met her. She's she one of my friends. She's the CEO of his company in South Africa, the Neville Group. I'm so surprised to see her. Do. And, that's, and I was over there learning. And then I have the accent in Africa, not them. So I played. I, I, cut, I didn't know none of the names. Look, most of the names didn't even fit on the name tag. I mean, they got names, man, five, eight syllables long. I was over there struggling. So I made the humor about the fact that I'm, I'm the foreigner here. Okay. I got to learn this. And so the, the joke became Steve doesn't understand anything about us. But at the same time, we the same. Mm. So I made them understand how culturally close we really were. That I really, man, I'm, I'm African-American. Key word, African. Because mm -hmm. there's too many days I don't feel American at all. Mm. At all. Really, tell you the truth. You don't know the truth about me. I prefer being called black. I really do. Mm. I like black. Steve, you black. I like black. I like that because it, it tells the story for me. Mm -hmm. And I'm comfortable with that. You know, that African-American because I, I'll, I'll die, identify with African-American when that constitution applies to all of us. Mm -hmm. if, if, if this country, okay, we off into something else. Here. <laughs> if this country. It's okay would allow that constitution to apply to all of us, that would be fair. But it don't. It just don't. And, you know, it's people like you who can make a difference in that. Because you are the young mind. See, your mind is different than your parents' mind. Hopefully. Hopefully. <laughs> it's not all the way there yet, but you got a better chance. And you got a better chance because of hip-hop, to be honest with you. Hip-hop merged the cultures, because it used to just be one music. Hip-hop became your music. You know, I'm an R&B man. Hip-hop kind of crossed all cultures, and it made y'all feel more and more about each other. But you all, as young lawyers, have a chance to change this thing. You all can get in there and do the right thing instead of the usual thing. Y'all know this justice system ain't worth a damn. You know it. You looking at it. So now you want to be a part of it? You want to be a part of it so you can do the same thing? Or are you going to get up in here and make some changes? Or are you going to sit up in here and just take the money and go status quo? We're going to keep doing it the way it is. You know this thing ain't right. You can't sit here with an intellectual mind and tell me that this is what justice is supposed to look like. You can't let these cops keep killing these black faces and don't nobody do nothing about it. That don't make no damn sense. See... How? Okay, go ahead, because no, oh. no, okay, but see, no, check this out. The only way this is going to change mm. is when it starts happening to everybody. It's the only way it's going to change, man. See, I'm on something else right now, but I'm just appealing to you as young lawyers. The future of what this country could be is in people's like your hands. You understand what I'm saying to you? You know it ain't right. 
it's a problem because all the black kids that get shot by police are black. Ain't now white kid got shot. I don't, I ain't seen the story of a police officer killing a white kid. Now, I don't want that to happen, but is that what's going to have to happen for things to change? Or can it change with somebody just saying enough is enough? See what happened with George Floyd. The only reason we got the George Floyd thing right is because everybody was home with COVID. And you were sitting there and you couldn't go to happy hour. And you wasn't on spring break. You was at the house watching that man with his knee on his neck for 8 minutes and 46 seconds. Ah, and it got caught on film. But I got to tell you something. If that little black girl didn't have that camera, his ass be at the house too. Mm. Mm. Well, this ain't funny no more, so. <laughs> Listen, we have hard conversations all around this law school, and we're challenged as faculty to think about what our positions can mean in society all the time. So whether you are an entertainment lawyer keeping a young entertainer from blowing his entire advance on one thing or being caught up and arrested and his record deal is over and his entire family has been relying on that record deal to lift their situation, we all can make changes in that way no matter what discipline of law we're going into. So we are in this building, in this courtroom, to learn the law and to go out there and to apply it as we see fit and hopefully that is to help somebody else so see that girl right there yeah with the bird no she gonna change something because i you know i can look i ain't saying that nobody else but i was just watching her expression she gonna change something that dude right there he gonna change something that dude right there you the one who had the g on you oh glenville yeah <laughs> Well, I, but I can just tell, man. I just want. I, I don't look. I don't mean to look like be preacher, or get on the soapbox. But I'm 65 years old. I'm exhausted. I'm tired of asking this country, "Can I be equal?" I'm so sick of that, man. Damn. What? <laughs> Why? Well, it's very simple. And y'all know, y'all can do this, man. Y'all from a generation of, of more forward-thinking people. You know, our parents. My father was racist. But he was supposed to be. Shit, my dad was born in 1914. He wasn't supposed to like nobody white. No, well, I'm trying to tell you now, he was very justified in his racism. But me, I, I, I had to come out of that. Because I'm, I'm, I'm finna go work with him. I'm finna go make money with everybody. My father was proud of what I became before he died. But in, you born as a black person, 1914, this ain't cool. My grandfather was a slave. Did you hear what I just said? My grandfather was a slave till he was 12 years old. Not my great-grandfather. My father's father was a slave. What? <laughs> Man, I'm, I'm, I'm close to the edge. I should have been... <sighs> Come on, man. Just just make a change. I don't care if you get an entertainment law or something. Don't sit up in here and, and, and let them keep doing it the way they've been doing. Because y'all have power. You're brilliant, you're young, and you're gifted. And there's a calling being put on your life to do the law the right way. Not the regular way. There's a calling to do it the right way. Because you know. Look how y'all sitting in here. Do you know law school didn't even used to look like this? Y'all black, white, Indian, Latino, Asian, y'all all sitting in here together. That used to didn't be the case. Well, do something with it. Well, sit up in here, man, and just sit up here with your little pen and go make your money. Because if I see you, so I'm going to have this billion dollars in about another year and a half. And if I see you, I swear to God, I'm going to buy you out. I'm going to ruin your ass. I'm going to buy your whole firm and put you out and turn your firm into a daycare. <laughs> put swings and shit in your office. And <laughs> I'm sorry. I was gonna there you it, it got all tight there for a second and I was gonna go like let's what's your advice but like you loosened it up like that quick yeah, see, so I, I, I I, I, see I know how to do that yeah. when I see the room tight I, I got thank a you. gift I can spin it back thank you because I didn't want I didn't want it to get like that because they're good people I didn't want them to think I you know was saying they was going to hell and nothing you know <laughs> 
So you woke up, you wanted um, Family Feud Africa, and then did you wake up and you were like, Judge Steve Harvey? That was a phone call. Brandon set up a phone call. He said, Mr. H, ABC wants to talk to you. And, you know, because uh, what happened was Celebrity Family Feud is a huge hit on ABC. Well, I had offered the show since I was on NBC at the time. I had little big shots on in the Steve Harvey talk show. So I took it to NBC. They said they didn't want it. So I took it over to ABC. ABC turned it into a smash hit. The guy that was running NBC at the time came to me and said, he came to my trailer and said, what would I have to do to get you to stop doing Family Feud? Okay, well, you know what that answer is. Pay me. <laughs> but then he started hemming the hard, and then I changed my eyes out. I don't care what they pay me. I'm just going to stick. And he called himself paying me back by taking off little big shots. And the Steve Harvey show at the same time canceled it on the same day. He said, we'll just get rid of him. Well, here's the deal. Remember this, young people. When the door closes, don't stand there beating on it. Walk up the hall. God has another door. That's probably bigger than the door that they slammed in your face. So instead of getting a write-in campaign and all that you see people doing trying to say they show, you cancel the show, cool. I walked up the hall. And ABC said, he's doing such a great job. Man, we could get him on a primetime scripted show, which is a sitcom. So they said, Brandon, we'd like to talk with Steve. And so the morning of the call, I'm at Tyler Perry Studios taping uh, Family Feud. I said, Brandon, who's on the call? He said, about 12 people. I said, 12 people? Who? He said, comedy development, scripted, the president of ABC, the vice president of ABC, the head of business affairs. Wait a minute. Business affairs don't get on that phone. They don't get on nothing. They all here to do a deal. I said, wow, this is big. So we get on there, and they said, Steve Harvey, we love you. We want you to do a scripted show. They went down this whole list of these scripted shows. Which one do you want? And it's yours. And I said, well, that's another sitcom. I said, after I left the Steve Harvey show with Sid and, and Wendy, I said, that's the greatest experience I ever had. It's too much work. I don't want to work that hard no more. They said, well, you don't understand. We'll give you the show. I said, I don't want to do it. They couldn't understand that, man. You don't get, he said, we'll pay you the rate you're making per day on Celebrity Family Feud. A lot of money, man. That's a lot of money. Every day? You told that up, man. I'm, 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 I'm walking out of there with a lot of money for one week. That's a, it's, it's a chunk. But I know now my life, I'm tied up, sun up, sun down. I said, I don't want to do it. They couldn't believe it. Finally, the president said, so what would you want to do? I said, well, the only show I ever really wanted to do, I thought of this about 12 years ago. I want to be a judge on TV. <laughs> <laughs> you could have heard a rat pissing on a ball of cotton <laughs> in the corner. It got so quiet. That lady said, a judge on TV? And then I heard the guy on the Zoom go, is he a lawyer? <laughs> <laughs> they, was, they was trying to work it out in their mind. The people on that Zoom was just going through it. Has he ever been to law school? <laughs> what did he say he wanted to do? And then I heard one dude, he said, fucking judge. <laughs> I said, so uh, then this guy goes, what, what makes you think you could be a judge. I said, shit, Donald Trump was president. <laughs> he a reality star, now he the president. How the hell is so far-fetched I can't be a judge? They said, well, how do you see it happening? I said, well, this is what I would do. I said, I would do the cases, but I would use my, my gift, which is humor, and they said, but do you know the law? Well, most of the laws I knew I broke. Uh, 
I'm not really like law. I don't know no law. I say, but I got real good common sense. I said, but I don't want to do like murder, no shit like that. <laughs> I want to do like small claims. Oh, motherfucker arguing about a dresser and shit like that. I, I don't want to be like, and I don't like, really want to be no law. They said, well, 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 and what would you do? I said, I wouldn't focus on the law because I don't know law. I'll, I'll care about the story. I just want to hear the story. I'm not Judge Judy and all this here. I just want to do the story. They said, oh my God, really? We'll get back to you. And I've heard that a million times. I was telling the guy today, I've been to 120 pitches. Over 120 pitches, I have five shows on TV out of 120 pitches. I got five shows on TV. So I hung the phone up. Brandon said, hey man, where the hell <laughs> did you come up with being a judge? I said, hey, B, I thought about this shit about 12 years ago. I thought it would be dope. He said, and so he was talking to my other guy on the phone. He said, did, you ever, did Mr. Harvey ever tell you anything about this? He said, no. The next day, ABC called and said, we're green lighting the show. We'll give him 10 guaranteed episodes. The show was bought. It happened so fast. Next thing you know, the next six months, I don't even know how to do a judge show. I don't know nothing about it. I really didn't think they was going to go for it. I was just trying to get them off the phone, <laughs> you know, because I wasn't going to do a sitcom. Once again, here, here, here come God. I ain't want to do Family Feud. You know, I, I didn't want to do a lot of stuff. Then here he come to the judge show. So, what I did was I told Brandon, I said, now listen to me. I'm owning everything. I'm owning everything. They don't want to do that. We ain't doing nothing. Do you know, and this is the first time I've owned everything. Think of this. You have an IP, an intellectual property. First of all, it's a judge show that's done in prime time. Never ever on TV has a judge show been on at night. Secondly, I'm going to interject humor. Nobody has ever done that. So I have a very unique property that I've come up with. So now, every time ABC get a check, I get a check. But not, not only do the star of the show, I get that check. I get an EP check. I get a created by check. I get an ownership check. And on top of all of that, I don't care what happens if we take it to NAPTI and we franchise it, I own that too, and we just made sure every time ABC eats, I eat. And that right there, and, and let me tell you, it's so crazy right now, it's such an incredible deal. Tonight, as a matter of fact, is the first time this is the season finale of the Judge Show. It's a double run. Do you understand how... You don't double run a show in prime time unless it's a monster. They're not going to put you on back to back. So they're running a double run season finale tonight, which sends us the other signal that it really is a major hit. And so now we're in a, we're in a great position. Uh, Brandon, Brandon uh, let me tell you something how slick he is. He didn't milk this deal. I don't, don't. Do you know that we're in such a position right You're now? Right we have all the leverage. All the leverage. And it's coincidental because my family feud deal is up. And the number you said, I went, oh, okay. That's <laughs> Me and Brandon, I saw Brandon with the right, and I said, I don't know what these damn kids done figured out. <laughs> but you better believe I'm going in there with y'all sheet of paper. <laughs> and let me tell you something, man. If you don't think that I'm finna get a sheet of this paper, that y'all can, I'm finna walk in there, and this is what the Georgia State School of Law <laughs> says I ought to get. Now, I'm going to lay that on that table and walk my ass right out of there. <laughs> y'all put up a number. I said, y'all better be. And you know what? Like, technically, man, 
I'm telling you right now, that is so on point with what we're doing, it's scary. Y'all, y'all own to something, man. I, I don't know how you did your numbers and where you got it from, but y'all's ass is on point. And I'm going to tell you, man, it's going to be funny because we're in the process now. Now, the leverage I have with the judge show is going to play very, very well with this family feud. Because guess what? Now, ABC came to us and said, do you want to syndicate your show? You know what syndicated TV is? Oh my God, Oprah Winfrey money. <laughs> now, the only difference between me and Oprah, I want you to understand something. Oprah got a billion dollars and she bought own network. I got a billion dollars. Uh, you have seen the last of me. <laughs> I'm not buying a damn thing. My ass is gone. And you'll know the day after I get the billion dollars, you'll know. Because when you cut your TV on, I ain't going to be on that song, bitch. <laughs> Love it. Well, look at the, um, just the progression of a deal for you. We started talking, you know, an hour, whatever amount of time, and we end with full ownership and leverage out the wazoo. Um, we talk a lot about exclusivity and the fact that you have managed to do things in this industry that most would not be able to do because of how you have so cleverly negotiated exclusivity. You um, know that too. Yeah, we, we've talked about it all. <laughs> and if it weren't... For <laughs> If it hadn't been for um, being able to manage exclusivity and define it in each of the things you were doing, you wouldn't have been able to jump to all the networks like you've done so gracefully. And that's really a true statement, man. I mean, like, every contract has exclusivity in it. Yes. I just take it out. You can't take that out. Okay, well, I ain't going to do the deal. Right. Take it out. They first started taking it out because they said, well, he's not going to be able to do all these shows. Do you know, uh, a few years ago, man, I had six TV shows running at one time. I had six full-time, prime-time shows on at one time. Wow. I was making so much money, but I was dying. Yeah. I had no days off. I taped seven days a week. I taped all the time. My wife would say, Steve, you got to slow down. But I was trying to, you know, I've always been running from my past, you know, I've always, at three years living in a car, man, that was, that was, that was crushing, man, and I've always been running from that. And the reason, one of the reasons my grind is the way it is is because I've just always, the, I, I can't go back to that. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm about like, somebody asked me one time, man, why you buy such expensive cars? Well... In case all this go bad, and I got to live in my car again. <laughs> I'm going to be living in a really nice-ass car. <laughs> but, you know, you, you work to acquire nice things. But after a while, man, it's not the things that can motivate you. Because, I mean, I have everything. My motivation now is my legacy my family, my children. I got grandkids now, man. You know, when you, I know when you look at me, you think, man, he is so fly. <laughs> and you're right. <laughs> <laughs> but I got grandkids, man. Yeah. Just before when I was coming over here, I was almost late because little Ezra saw me and he ain't seen me in a couple of weeks. And Papa, I want to ride you back. And I said, no, I got to go. Eh. So I got to ride his ass on my back a little bit, you know. <laughs> And I rode him real hard, so his little, cause he was on the back of my neck, and he's he's potty trained, so now he just wear regular underwear. And I know if I ride him real back, his little jewels will be slapping up against the back of my neck real hard, and his ass almost passed out. So, <laughs> Papa, put me down, put me down, yeah. I just ended the ride real quick that way, you know. You got to know how to get rid of kids at a certain age. You just. This shit you have to learn. Like if you have a baby and the baby don't go to sleep, just blow in their eyes and they, they'll keep doing that. <laughs> and they're blowing their nostrils and they take their breath away. <laughs> and then after a while, they just go on and go to sleep. You know, I've, been, I've been putting little kids to sleep for a long time. 
my daughter Brandy, let me tell you, man, Brandy and Carly twins, right? And like, uh, I was poor, really poor, man. And so like diapers was killing me, man. I got two kids shitting. And these huggies, they, they was wiping my ass out. So I was out of work and their mom used to go to work and I'd stay home with them. For two weeks, I had to stay home with them. I got tired of buying them diapers. So I would like put a lot of chairs in a circle and put newspaper <laughs> on the ground and just let them walk around naked. <laughs> they be peeing and shitting in the floor. And then I just roll up the newspaper, and then, you know, we only used two diapers that day. The College of Law would like to make a disclaimer that none of this advice and or facts are um, being given by the law school. I'm just trying to help you. Yeah, just a little disclaimer. You're going to have a child one day. You're going to need these cost-saving measures. (laughs) I'll tell you something else that's really funny. Like, Brandy would be laying in the floor, and I used to just test, like, little stuff I'd, like, take like ice water and just like drop a drop on her stomach and just shoot her at. <laughs> Brandy that's why she, trauma she's is a what public she speaker it. now because I used to just <laughs> shock her ass. In it. Sorry about that. Okay, I do have um, a couple of students who want to ask a question and I want to get them to that, but I do, you know, I think I'll go to that first before I do my final question. So who was the first, where's my first student sitting who was in, yes, there you are. Introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Devon. I'm a fan. You're graduating for you. I'm originally from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And one of the questions for our class was, um, what are some of the things you think about when you go to the college? Like, what are some of the things that you think about when you go to the college? Like, what are some of the things that you think about when you go to the college? Like, what are some of the things that you think about when you go to the college? Like, what are some of the things that you think about when you go to the college? Like, what are some of the things that you think about when you go to the college? Like, what are some of the things that you think about when you go to the college? Like, what are some of the things that you think about when you go to the college? Like, what are some of the things that you think about when you go to the college? Like, what are some of the things that you think about when you go to the college? Like, what are some of the things that you think about when you go to the college? Like, what are some of the I was getting done up by my ex-wife in the in the media, media takeout, everything. They was just doing me. And we got a lawyer one time. And the lawyer said, Steve, do you blog? I went, no, man, I ain't got no time for that. He said, do any of your business partners blog? I said, no, no, I don't. He said, do any of your friends blog? I said, no. He said, does anybody you do business with, do they blog? I said, no. He said, you know why? Because people like that don't have time. He say, ignore it. See, when they blog about me, it's a blog. If I respond, it's a press conference. Mm-hmm. See, so I don't give them no fire. And nothing a hater has said about me has affected anything I got going. Oh, he finished. Oh, really? Am I? He's the dumbest person on TV. Uh, well, what you don't know is you think because I made the mistake on Miss Universe, I'm the dumbest person on TV. Well, they wanted me to come back the next year because it would be even m- more viewers, right? Well, now, guess what? Now, I own Miss Universe. So now, who are you talking to? Who the dummy now? Oh, that's right. You feel me? So I don't let, no, they, I don't care what they say about me. It doesn't matter. They don't matter, and what they say don't matter. It, they, they don't have, a person can only affect you if you allow them. A people only matter if you allow them. So what you going to say about me? What I care? He this, he that. You don't even know me. You ain't even never met me, man. Everybody that talks about, and especially men, when I hear a man talking about me, I just look at him. How weak can you be? You don't even know me. Mm-hmm. Bruh, Really? Tell the truth. Have you ever met me? 99.9% of the time, no. So I care nothing about them. Nothing. Thank you. Who had the next question? Great. Hi, Mr. Harvey. My name is Paul Haley, um, second year of the class. And so we also wanted to ask you, we spent a lot of time learning about all of your decisions and your, your aspirations and how you had your career from a very legal point of view. Mm-hmm. So we were curious how has your personal background uh, informed your career and the decisions you've made within it? Well, you know, that's an interesting question because we are all the sum total of our past. And you got to remember, man, that God has an amazing way of taking your past and, and, and using it to your advantage. If you had a disadvantaged childhood, 
you you could you gonna be able to use that if you had a rough upbringing you're gonna be able to use that like i was i grew up in a tough neighborhood so i grew up tough man you know i've been fighting my whole life so i'm a fighter you know uh I don't have an education. I have a high school diploma, like I was telling a group of students. I gra my graduating class was 695. I graduated 690. <laughs> and I gave them five people hell that was behind me. <laughs> Every time I saw their ass, hang in there, dog. <laughs> I've used everything that happened to me, two divorces, Living in a car for three years, a stuttering problem, told I would never be nothing. I, I've lost everything twice. I've taken all of that and it has turned me into who I am today. My overcoming power is wicked, man. I'm a bad boy, man. I don't care what you do to me. You can't crumble me. What you going to do? What? I already been homeless. What you got? They thought when they canceled my show, I was finished. I lived in a car for three years. See, I used that. So every time somebody say I'm taking something from you, they forgot I had nothing. I come from nothing. I've lost it all twice anyway. If I lost it again, I could get it back. Let me tell you something. Mother's Day coming. Do you know how I make a lot of money? I have a lot of things. If I could have my mother back, I would sell all of it. I would give every dollar I got if I could get her back. Man, you give up everything just to have your mama back. Every, every dollar, every piece of property, every house, I give it back. Because you know why? Because I know how to go get it again. Because I got that dog in me, man. I'm unbreakable. You can't break me because you didn't make me. I'm created by my heavenly father. You had nothing to do with it. So when you come up with these ways, you're going to crumble Steve Harvey. Hold up, homie. I got news for you. I ain't over here by myself. You come over here messing with me. I'm a child of the most high. You come for me if you want to. Cussing and all. I still belong to him. So when you come for me, man, you better, I'm telling you, have a lunch bucket with you. Because, partner, I am all you want. I'm that and everything else. I'm one of the strongest willed people that you will ever meet. And you can become that if you use the mishaps in your life and apply them. Stop. That's what kills me with celebrities. They get where they're going and then they forget to tell the truth. What helps me is my transparency. See, the fact that I'm willing to tell people that I messed up, that I made mistakes. Because you're going to mess up and make a mistake. I can't stand when people write books. Donald Trump got this book out talking about he turned his father's million dollars into, into an empire. Well, that's true. He did give him a million dollars. But he left something out the book. When his father died, they split 800 million. You don't think you can make it? Give me 200 million. <sighs> Watch the show. So see, what I decided was to be transparent mm. about it. And I appreciate y'all doing this study on my life because like it's, it's a trip, man. You know, I'm, 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 a, I'm, a, I'm just a hood boy. I come out of Cleveland, Ohio. I come from the dirt. And, and I'm at a law school. I'm a case study. And then y'all said, you don't know who you're going to do next. Whoever it is, it ain't finna be me. <laughs> <laughs> I can promise you that. And when they come in here to talk to you, very few people are going to give it to you the way I'm going to give it to you. Because they don't want to, they, they want to tell you about this side of it. They don't want to tell you about the side that got them here. That's my specialty. I'm telling you, you finna mess up so bad. You finna blow it. But you can blow it and recover from that. Let me tell you something. You're allowed to make three major mistakes in your life. And you're going to use up all of them. I didn't use my three. I have no more. And I know that. So that's why you... Hey, look, man. You know why you don't see me on TMZ? You don't never see me on TMZ. You know why? Because I don't go nowhere where they can put my ass on it. I go home, partner. I, know that's I right. bought a house where I can go home. Everything I want at my house behind my gate. I go home because I ain't got no mistakes I can make. I done used up my three major ones. Mm. It's over with. Mm. I got the chick of my dreams. I got grandkids. I got smart kids. Cool. I'm out. 
Her and, her and Carly got college degrees. I paid for it. They ain't got no student loans. All my kids, ain't not one of them got a student loan. All of them that went to college. I done, I done done mine. I done done all of mine. And now all I got to do is just make it to the tape. All I got to do is not do a couple more deals. See this judge show? Woo-hoo. This the one right here. <laughs> Three years later, I'm just telling you, don't, please don't turn your TV on looking for me. <laughs> That's, that's, that's really true. We'll take the last question. Where is the last question? Okay, awesome. You know, that's a strong question. Oh. I wish I could say I would, but it would be in my best interest if I didn't. Because then I would be somebody different. You're going to need everything that happens to you. You're going to need it to happen in the exact order that it happens mm -hmm. to get you where you want to go. Remember something. Listen to me. Everything you're going to go through and going through is God preparing you for what you ask for. That's, that's a fact, man. Young people. Listen to me. That's a fact. Look, if you're not a spiritual person, look, I ain't know you was what's coming, so I, I just have the way I talk, and this is the way I am. I'm just telling you, spirituality has something to do with it. Don't get hung up out here with this ignorant mess right here. This whole ain't no God. You know, I was doing Pierce Morgan show one time, and he said, Steve, I understand there's a statement that you don't talk to atheists. Now, I said, I don't. He said, well, aren't you a Christian? Isn't it your job? To convert people? I didn't sign up for that side of it. <laughs> I'm not in the soul conversion business. If you don't want to believe in God, go to hell. <laughs> I'm, I'm perfectly fine with that. If you want to go to hell, say bye. Bye. Me, I don't. He said, why is that? I said, because listen to me, if I am talking to you and you don't believe in God, I think you're a fool. On the other hand, you who don't believe in God, if you're talking to me and I believe in what you think is this hocus pocus higher power, you must think I'm a fool. I just don't think two fools ought to need to be standing around talking. <laughs> So I don't have no room for it. And, and that's all it is. It's just me being who I am at all times. I'm going to tell you one last story. I was in NBC. Now, y'all probably not going to feel this because y'all young and you've been speaking good grammar your whole life. But uh, they had problems with me when I first got on TV. And they said, Steve, we don't think you're speaking grammatically correct. And so they hired this lady to come in to me, and what, did, what was she called? Dialect coach? Linguist. A a linguist. Ling linguist. So when she came in, I said, excuse me, she said, I'm your linguist, linguist coach. So I thought she was going to teach me how to make pasta. You know, because <laughs> I thought that was really interesting, you know, because, oh, lingu linguist. I said, this would be real nice. She said, no, I'm here to help you with your grammar. I said, for what? She said, because they've decided that you'll be more successful on TV if you were more grammatically correct. I said, oh, I ain't finna do all that. She said, excuse me? I said, I ain't finna do all that. She said, could you say that slowly for me? I said, I ain't finna do all that. Lat, L-A-T, lat, you know what I'm talking about. She said, that's exactly why I'm here. I said, well, you know, you just wasting your time because I ain't even bought all that. She said, what did you say just now? I said, I ain't bought all that. I said, you want me to say that slow? I ain't bought all that. She said, sir, if you don't learn how to speak more properly, you won't be a success on TV. I said, ma'am, let me ask you something. Which one of these sound best to you? I... Wait a minute, hold on. Let me see how I said it to you. <laughs> I 
am broke or Ami is rich. I like Ami is rich. And that ended that right there, so. Okay, to wrap this up, we had a chance to learn all about the foundation and all of the great work that you're doing. And Can uh, you hold for one second? Sure. I, do for y'all. I got something for y'all. I don't want to forget. Come on, big man. <laughs> Um, thank you. <laughs> thank you all so much for being a great audience. Absolutely. Hello, Tony Richards. <laughs> Hello, Dr. Perry. Y'all, something. Y'all gonna have to repair one of them latrines in there. <laughs> you okay? You need a minute? Let me tell you something. I done chipped the porcelain off one of them bad boys. <laughs> you know, I was trying to hold on, but you know, I'm 65, so I just said, this ain't gonna be a look good look. Not in front of these law kids. <laughs> They'll probably sue me for something. You know, I did this here. I said, let me go and hold on. I went, this only works if you a girl. Yeah, that didn't work out for me, so. I'm so sorry. I should have given you a break. No, no, it's cool. Okay. Big man took me in there. That's my boy right here. Me and him, we we the same age about, so. Me and him, we was running. Pretty fucked up run up that ramp. Boy, I was so hurt when he said that bathroom was up that ramp. <laughs> Woo! That took everything I had. Okay, so we're going to wrap this up. and. Uh... Oh, I'm good oh. now. Okay, good. We want to take care of you in here. Um, so we learned about the foundation and all the great work of the foundation. And I had um, known about the f- uh, foundation and a lot of the work. A good friend of mine, Dr. Steve Perry, is here. And he had been telling me about, you know, coming and speaking to the boys and all of the, you know, challenges sometimes and um, all of the work that is done. What does the foundation work mean to you? Well, my mother was a Sunday school teacher. And she told me when I was a little boy, I didn't understand it then. But she kept saying, boy, one day, God going to give you a big house up on the hill. You can't get a big house up on the hill and don't tell nobody else how to get up there. She said, remember that. And that stuck with me. 
When I got old, I finally learned what she was talking about. And the foundation got formed uh, 22 years ago when my father died. And it was the second most crippling time of my life. The worst thing that ever happened to me was my mama died when I was 40. Man, I, that pain, I thought I was going to die, man. Mm. And I'm a tough dude, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm really tough. I'm a really tough guy, man. I can take a lot. But my mama passed, man. God, talk. I, I didn't know what to do. She was the greatest person I had ever known in my life. Three years later, my father died from heartbreak. Mm -hmm. He wasn't sick or nothing. He just, his heart was broke. He's telling me all the time, boy, guess I just go on and see your mama. This ain't nothing down here without her. And I said, man, that was so cold to me. And at my father's funeral, when he was in that casket, man, I was sitting there. And I was thinking on that day, I said, man, what would I have done if it wasn't for this dude right here? I, it's no way I could have made it. I grew up on 112th and Superior. I'm in the hood. We, we was doing some tough cats up in there, man. And it, it just no way I would have gotten out of there without his guidance. And on the plane, going back home, after the funeral, I said, man, what do boys do that ain't got no father? How, what do they do? Because I'm trying to tell you something, man. Trying to be a man without a male role model is like an explorer without a map. It just ain't no way to get here. And so I said, man, I got to start doing something about that. So I said, my foundation was going to be originally boys who were from single parent homes headed up by women. And I was going to teach them the principles of manhood and how to dream. Because, you know, it's hard for single women when they got boys because it's a daunting task for a woman to try to raise a boy because you have no idea how to do it. And that's not anything disrespectful to a woman. It's like when Brandon Carly was born, I had no idea how to turn a girl into a woman. What do I know about it? I ain't no woman. Their mother did that. She turned them into ladies and women. I don't know the first thing about it. So guess what? You can raise your child to be law-abiding, a Christian, God-fearing, you know, smart, a good student, but you can't turn him into a man, though. No. It takes another man to do that. So I started the foundation at first just for boys. And it, my whole mission with these boys is to teach them only two things the principles of manhood, and dream building. See, one of the problems with school systems today, um, and this ain't knocking education. I just know what the problem is because it was a problem for me. See, school doesn't teach you how to be successful. What school does, it teaches you how to memorize, recall information, and apply some logical thought. And then if you can recall it good enough, we'll give you an A, and we'll give you a high G point, G, a GPA, and we'll give you a degree. And that's perfectly fine. But after that, we got to start doing this thing called life. And life ain't got nothing to do with your GPA. Life don't care that you magnum cum laude. <laughs> don't give a damn, man. I'm telling you right now. It just don't. And so what I focus on and the problems with schools, instead of having study hall, you know what schools should implement? Schools should implement a dream building course for kids to sit them down in a room once every 30 days and just talk about their dreams. Because your dreams is more important than your education. I said that at a school one time. That lady cut that mic off so fast. <laughs> Boy, they set my ass down at that school. That lady said, don't you ever stand up in front of a student body and tell them that the most important thing is a dream and not the education. I said, lady, what you have me come talk to these kids for? You brought a person in here that ain't got no education. 
and then you want me to talk to you about the importance of education. Nothing is bigger than the dream. See, you dream one day of being a lawyer, and it spurred you to get the education to fulfill the dream. See, without the dream, man, you're going to drop out. You ain't going to pass the bar. Your dream is to be a lawyer. You dig? But if you take the dream out the equation, what you in here for? You studying this hard if you, if you don't see your day self one day being a lawyer, you're going to go through this? You've already been in school four years. You got a degree. I don't know why you in here. <laughs> this shit is the most amazing thing I've ever seen. You're a special group of people. You have a degree. Then y'all going to go to school again? You know how smart you have to be to even come up with that? You, you people are brilliant. But it's this dream that's got you in here. So if schools would implement a dream system, to ask people, see if you ask a little boy what you dream of doing, I want to fly an airplane. Well, you ain't got to kick his ass to go to school now. Because now, guess what? To fly an airplane, you're probably going to need to be good at math and science and engineering. It spurs them to get an education. That's what the dream is doing. So I talk to the boys about dream and what real manhood is. Real manhood. Real men take care of their children. Real men go to church. Real men honor women. Real men obey the law. Real men go to work every day. Our young people today, man, I don't care what nobody say. You can feel how you want to feel after I say this one right here. Hip-hop has been good because it has made more millionaires than any music genre ever in the history of this world. But it's been a disservice too, though. Because our lyrics, man, we are so lyrically incorrect. <laughs> We the only group of people that degrade our women in our music. It's, it's a sad situation, man. And then you wonder why so many women are disrespected. It's in the song. They dance into the beat. It's in the beat. They put it to a beat. And now the disrespect is there. You every name under the sun as women. To music. And you at the club, you dancing to it. So when he call you one, what's the problem? You in here like, the, you at the club, with, you doing this to the music. So when he call you one of them names, what's the problem? You feel me? So now, I got to undo all this when I get these boys. I got to tell a boy, no man, real men respect women. Treat women like you want somebody to treat your mother. Do you know how, do you know how, do you know what I'm trying to untwist? And in five days, I'll do a hell of a job of it, man. I got, dude, I got dudes in here. It's my man right there from my mentoring camp. My man over there from my mentoring camp. These dudes is qualified, man. This, I got eight ministers from my, from my ministry camp. I had Crips and Bloods in there, man. Gang banging. Kept working with them. The, the, the little crip, he was just hard, man. This dude was everything. He's an engineer today. He's an engineer. Because I put a, I told him how to dream. He thought he had to be a crip because everybody in the hood is a crip. Look, man, you can change a person's life with the dream. I'm, I'm, I'm in front of this law school today because at 10, at 10, I dreamed of being on TV. At 10. But see, you... You got to write these visions out. The Bible says, write the vision and make it plain. So that he who reads it will run to it. And even though it tarry, wait for it. For surely it will come at an appointed time. That's Habakkuk 2 and 2. That's in the Bible. You better get hip to this one right here. Because you're going to need this one more than you need your degree. Because after you get your degree, what, what, what you going to do with your dream then? You, you, you think that's it when you become a lawyer? No, man. You got obligations after that. You got to change some lives. You got to get right. So the mentoring camp I got was to get young men to dream and become the proper type of men. Real men, it ain't your rims, it ain't your chain. Them ain't your girls in the video. That ain't your money that's spread on the table. It's not. And once I get a young man to understand that, I have their undivided attention. And then I have only men talking to men. And so they never see it. I got young boys who have never heard a male tell them they loved them before because they live with their aunt, their grandmama, and their mama. I got boys crying because I got men barking at them. They talking to me so rough. No, no, no. That's how we talk. 
I got boys get off the bus. You ain't going to do nothing to me. Because we have cameras filming them when they get off the bus. You ain't going to do nothing to me. I do what I want to do. Well, these cameras going to be gone in a minute. <laughs> it's going to be dark out here. We in the country. You're going to be very afraid. And we get their attention. And then my wife runs the girls program. Now the girls program is different because Marjorie takes girls from all different backgrounds. Marjorie's philosophy is if you mix the privilege with the underprivileged and you give the underprivileged a chance to see what the privileged side live, lives like, they get a vision of what that is. But then you take the privilege and all of a sudden they develop a heart for the underprivileged. See y'all, y'all right now, y'all privileged. The question is, will you have a heart for the underprivileged? After you become lawyers, will you change something? You can do it, man. Because it ain't just about the money. So we spend millions of dollars on this camp. Now, this, let me see. Tuesday, I think, is the closing day. I'll be buying the Rock Ranch from Chick-fil-A. The Rock Ranch. 1,600 acres. I'm going to buy it. Just me and my wife will purchase it ourselves. I'm going to lease it to the foundation for $1. And I'm going to put a camp on. And like Robert Smith taught me, I spent time at Robert Smith's house one time. He taught me the most valuable lesson I've ever learned. He said, Steve, size up. Because I wanted to know how he had $13 billion. I just need one. I just needed to know what he did. I just need one. I'll get more, I'll take it. But if I get one, I'm good. He said the key is to size up. And I didn't understand what you, what do you mean? He said, you get 300 boys at your camp. How do we do 13,000 of them? I said, man, I need more money than that. He said, well, then guess what? You got to size up. He said, what what'd you, what'd you put on your vision board for your number? I said, a billion. He said, take that number off and ask God for three billion. Size up. He said, what difference do it make? And oh, by the way, that's the book everybody should buy, The Magic of, the Magic of Thinking Big by David Schwartz. Buy this book. It'll change your life. Because it taught me the one thing he was trying to get me to understand, to size up. If I walk around the room and I give you all the key to any car you ask me for, and you say, I want a Volkswagen, and I ask you what kind of car you want, you say, I want an Audi 9, and I ask you what you want, you want a Rolls Royce. And I pull out the key, and I give you the key to the Volkswagen, the Audi, and the Rolls Royce. For a moment, all of you will be happy. But then, that one with that Volkswagen, <laughs> she has got to say at one point in time, man, if I'd have just said Rolls Royce. But see, guess what? It requires no more brain power to think small than it does big. One dollar, one million. Same brain power. I changed it when I sized it up. So if you're going to ask God for something, why waste your time with a little bit of request when all you got to do is size up? What you, what you, what you afraid of? He can't do it? He make billionaires all the time. So I sized up. Sizing up is big, man. They used to do it at fast food restaurant. They, they pimped the game. They, they were so slick with it. Uh, super size. And for an extra quarter, your ass get 400 more french fries. <laughs> it, it's, sizing up is, is a special thing. And so he taught me to size up. So this camp will allow me to service thousands of boys and girls instead of hundreds. And you have to give back. Most of you come from families that understand that you have to give back. God blesses you to become a blessing. You know, you can't, it doesn't work any other way. I used why you see rich people all the time trying to find somebody to give their money to. Because they're trying to, first they're trying to cool out their conscience. And then some of them just trying to Obey the law. Most of them is looking for tax write-offs, though. <laughs> That's the sad thing about it. But that foundation is really important to us, and Paige has done a wonderful job running it. She really changed it when she came along 
Uh, my daughter ran it for a while, but then she want to go off to Costa Rica and take girls on field trips and shit. And so um, I lost her. And uh, my other daughter is a uh, huge agent now, one of the top agents in the state. And gave me a grandson, so I don't bother her. Uh, my three sons, uh, Winton is in Abu Dhabi right now. He works there for me. Uh, Jason and Stevie are uh, trying to put themselves together and see where they want to fit into the plan. Stevie works on my TV shows right now. He's studying to be an AD. That ain't going to last, though, already, so that's not going to work. He's going to make way too much money. But, you know, I, got, I let my children do whatever they want to do. All my kids are artsy, all of them. They don't, they're not really number people. And then uh, the other one is Lori. Lori's doing really well. Um, I just, I got grandkids and I'm cool. I got, life is better than it's ever been. I got the baddest chick I could get. Let me say something to ladies too. This has nothing to do with it. But I want you to remember something about men in case you're wondering. Like don't ever let a man make you think he could do better. Don't ever let a man make you think he could do better. I'm going to tell you a secret about every man in here. We are with the baddest chick we could get. We are with the baddest chick we could get. It ain't a man nowhere with a chick and he could have got better. He doesn't exist. His ass is with you because you're the best that he can do. Don't let him fool you. I can get somebody else. Take your monkey ass on over there. <laughs> And let's see, he can't because he's with the baddest chick he can get. Some people talking about, man, if you wasn't with Marjorie, who would you be with? I'd be with Marjorie because she's the best chick I can get. Oh, you don't want Halle Berry? No, I'm with the baddest chick I can get, and which I think is bad as Halle Berry anyway, so I'm cool. So just know that, ladies. He is with you because he can't do any better. You are the cream of the crop, period. And don't ever let him make you think any different because, hey, I tell it to all. I don't want to start that. Let me go. That's why Brandy ain't married now because I won't let nobody. Brandy's the reason I, both, I, I wrote the book, Act Like a Lady, Think Like a Man. She's the reason. She was dating a boy, well, a young man, he was a trainer, and he had been by the house about four times, right? And so me and her uh, grandfather was in the kitchen making sandwiches, and he was in there. He was okay. We liked him. And so her grandfather said, so talking to him, the trainer, a little muscle-bound dude, you know, in shape and shit, that don't bother me. You know, broke ass standing around in here. He, he, you got a lot of muscles. You probably don't have money because you're in the gym too damn long, so... <laughs> And so my grand, her grandfather said, so young man, what's your plans for my granddaughter? And he said, oh, yeah, oh, man, we, yeah, we, yeah, we good, we good, pops. He said, no, no, what's your plans for my granddaughter? He said, oh, no, man, we ain't, you know, we ain't, we ain't planning nothing or nothing like that. So now I, I, I catch the conversation. So he sits down at the table and says, sit down, my man. So now it's me, him, and Brandy's grandfather. And I look at the dude and I say, hey, man, what my father-in-law is asking you is a legitimate question. What's your plans for my daughter? He said, well, I don't really have a plan. I said, no, bro, listen to me. Every man that walks up to a woman and introduces herself has a plan. We might not share with you what it is, but we got a plan. When we walk up to you, we're not, we're not asking your name because we're interested in your future, what your hopes and dreams are. We want you, and we got to come over here and see what it's going to cost. I said, so what's your plans for my daughter? He said, oh, we just kicking it. I said, cool. Brandy! <laughs> he, said, he, said, he, said, he said, Mr. Harvey, what you doing? 
what I'm doing. Motherfucker, I ain't on your side. <laughs> what, you, what you doing? Motherfucker, I'm finna tell. I said, Brandon, come here. Sit down. I said, now tell my daughter what you just told me. He said, oh, Mr. Harvey, oh, my ass, dog. I'm for real. You finna get, you finna get work. You don't even understand what's finna happen right here. You in a jam right now. Tell my daughter what you said when I asked you, what's your plan with my daughter? He said, I said, we was just kicking it. Her face cracked. She thought she had something. Then she came to me and she said, Daddy, how did you know to ask him that? I said, Brandy, you have to ask him that the day he walk up to you because he has a plan. And then we talked about us. She said, Dad, how do you know all this? I said, shit, because I've been him my whole life. I've been a boy my whole life. She said, Dad, you ought to write a book because women don't know this. Brandy said, you ought to write a book. I wrote, act like a lady, think like a man, seven million copies. <laughs> That's um. Uh, we're you gonna make some recommendations. You, you didn't get a check for that. My kids say that all the time. Dad, we don't like it when you use us in your show. I said, well, hold on, hold on. You see all these groceries y'all eating? And you know, all y'all got a room with your own bathroom in? I said, you know, you know what bought all this shit? Jokes. Now if. You ain't going to help me write none of these jokes. Your ass is going to be the joke. <laughs> well, I want to just say the, um, the ultimate thank you for um, one of the things I really hope with this class is that students get to have a real experience with the person that we're studying at the end of the class. And um, you have the busiest schedule of any human being. And when Brandon uh, said, no, he is going to come, uh, we were so delighted because we didn't know if that would really happen. But deep down, when I asked if you would do, if I could do this class after you, I knew you would come without having ever talked to Brandon because I just knew from watching you over the years, from listening to the way you talk, I knew you would come. And I never worried about it. It's, it's been my honor. No, it's been my no, honor. No, really, sister, look at me. It has been my honor. <sighs> it's been our honor. Listen. For somebody to think enough of me to do something like this, this is deep. I ain't no study. I'm a, I'm a miracle. Yeah. I'm telling you. Well, when we sized up, we got you. Nah, man. Yeah. Um, so, thank you.
know that you might not have gotten formal education, but you are our favorite judge. Two thousand and twenty two, and on the front it says Judge Steve. That's me. That's me. <laughs> hey, y'all, really, thank y'all. You know, from Rock and Rock, it does mean something to me. You know what I'm saying? I got a lot of awards in my life, you know. I got a lot of awards, man, but sometimes it ain't about the awards, sometimes it's, it's, it's about the rewards. And I'd rather my life be rewarded than awarded. I stopped working for awards a long time ago. This right here, this is a reward. This is y'all saying to me, man, you fly. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We appreciate you and the hustle. Keep dreaming. Don't ever give up. Talk to God. He'd love to hear from you. I'm telling you, prayer is necessary. Please understand that. But no matter what happens, don't ever, don't ever give up. I don't give a damn what pop off. You get your ass up and you keep going. And then tell God you appreciate it and he'll keep lifting you up. Thank y'all very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody, so much for coming and get home safely. Thank you.